live? Hello? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Let's begin class with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity again to study, to join together in fellowship. We ask that your spirit of truth and love will join us here and lighten our hearts and minds to be more like you. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. And a few announcements to make. Uh, this is an interesting announcement that came about. Um, this coming week's National Enquirer will have an uh, article based on the upcoming um, Aging Brain um, interview. They did an interview with me about a week and a half ago. Enquirer? The National Enquirer. Yes. It, the, no. This, yeah, that one. They will have a. They will have an article uh, with like uh, eight or ten little bullet points of things you can do to help keep your brain from aging. So they did an interview on me based on the upcoming book that's coming out in June. So I thought that was interesting. And then uh, our new TV program, uh, the Dr. Tim Jennings Show on WBTN TV uh, Network, begins broadcasting this Tuesday at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, we will send out a, uh, a um, blog on Monday with um, a Facebook post with all the links where people you can actually sign up and get a notification each week when a new show comes out. And um, this Thursday, March 8, at the Hickson United Methodist Church, I will be doing a presentation on um, drug-free treatments for depression uh, for the community there. So Hickson United Methodist Church, and that is at 7 p.m. on uh, this Thursday, March 8. And I think that's enough announcements for now. Well, no, when I make another couple more. Um, April 6, I'll be speaking to the student body at PUC. So if you know anybody at PUC, let them know I'll be out there on April 6, and then that'll be in the, in the midday afternoon. I'm not sure the exact time they've got me scheduled. Uh, in the evening of April 6 and all day on April 7, I'll be at the St. Helena SDA Church doing a seminar. And then if you know anybody in London, England, I will be speaking there um, May 25, 26 at the um, Stansborough Park SDA Church, and that information's in our notes. So if you want to let some people know ahead of time um, to plan, if you have some friends there. So our, our lesson today is debt, a daily decision, and we're doing uh, lesson 11 in the quarterly stewardship motives of the heart. And the memory verse for this week is from Romans 13, 7 and 8, and it reads, give everyone what, is, what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. So... What do you think about the debt to pay people respect? What does it mean to pay or show respect? Does showing respect to someone mean we surrender our judgment to some other person who might be in a position of authority or hold a certain office? That to respect them means that we let them tell us what to do. Does it mean um, we agree with people without our own um, thoughts on the matter. Does it mean we show that we value the person as a person, maybe admire and honor them um, as a, a reasonable individual, but we consider things for ourselves and come to our own conclusions? Yes. What would be the problem if we don't show respect? Well, let me give you an example. What happens when students don't show their teachers respect? They get disciplined. Other, other thoughts? That's a consequence of students, but okay, that's part of it. What else? What, what's the real problem when students don't show teachers respect? They don't, learn. they don't learn. If you don't respect the teachers having more knowledge or more perspectives or ideas you've never considered before, then you don't learn from what the teacher is trying to share from you. You discount what they're saying. What happens when children don't show parents respect? What's the problem? Same thing, children won't learn. What happens when people don't show their government's respect? They burn the flag. They burn the flag? <laughs> Kneel at football games? Riot. Riot? Really, what happens in a society when they really lose respect for the government? Chaos, Chaos happens. Yeah. Disorderliness, violence, insurrection. What happens when husbands and wives don't respect each other? Conflict. Conflict. Mm -hmm. 
I can tell you, I see a lot of people come to me for counseling where the husbands and wives has lo- have lost respect for each other. But how do you really love someone if you don't respect them? That's a great point. And this is the problem. So, that, so she says, how do you really love someone if you don't respect them? And, you know, I guess, I guess it is possible to love somebody without respect. Um, I just lost my place in my notes. Here we go. Um, It's possible to love somebody. Uh, For instance, you may have lost respect for somebody who has done some criminal things. Maybe a a child of yours has gotten into prison. You lost respect for their their way the way they've taken their life, but you still love them and you want them to become respectable again. Okay, but we're talking husband-wife relationship now. And I think your point is well taken. When you lose respect for your spouse in the marriage, it really undermines admiration, devotion. Uh, they're, they're, what happens, and I've seen this in my, my patients, when, when they lose respect for their spouse, they often start getting um, uh, dissatisfied, uh, uh, angry, bitter, uh, critical, negative, uh, to, uh, and the marriage really collapses. Yes, Russell. Well, respect is a two-way street. You must be respectable be respected. So this is a great point. You know, individuals, couples, families, communities, governments, it works the same. So respect, does it mean admiration necessarily? No, no. no, it doesn't. We cannot admire somebody, but yet respect, be respectable in the way we treat them. Or respectable for the position they hold. But within the husband-wife relationship, there's really something more than just being respectable to each other. To be healthy, there really needs to be a sense of admiration and respect toward the other person in a different way than maybe you might have for somebody who is in an office. I remember when I was in the military, you know, we had uh, sometimes commander-in-chief that maybe everybody didn't value or admire, but we showed respect to the office, okay? And uh, we treated the commander-in-chief with, with respect, even if we didn't find him respectable. You can't have that really work in a, in a healthy marriage, though. You can't just go through the pro forma behavioral respect and have a real marriage be healthy. There needs to be genuine respect. And that does require, Russell's pointing out, that each partner actually conduct themselves in respectable ways. What happened in Old Testament times when people didn't respect God? Pardon? God let them go. When they, when they no longer respected him, they no longer obey. So, so yeah, when you don't respect, you don't obey. When you don't respect, you listen. No. You don't hear. You're, this is the um, stiff-necked people. Eyes that see, but uh, eyes that, that see, but don't really comprehend. Ears that hear, but don't really hear. This type of thing. Do so you see a problem? across all types of relationships when we don't have respect, when we don't show proper respect. Can you disagree with somebody, even reject their ideas, but still show them respect? (coughs) Do you see that happening? Do we see that being modeled in our society today? No, No, we've lost this capacity in our society to disagree and still show respect. I, I, I can see a clear difference from a few decades ago where people disagreed, but they did it very respectfully. Look back at the old Reagan debates when Reagan was debating and they disagreed, but they were very respectable in how they did it. Um, The way people do today, it seems very disrespectful. Can you think of any examples in the Bible of young people failing to show respect? Yes, you guys all nailed it, yes. Um, When they made fun of Elisha, go up, you old bald head. Remember they were making fun of him? And the youth that uh, were, were, you know, making fun of the fact that Elijah went to heaven and making fun there also. Have you ever wondered in the aftermath of that why the, the bears mauled them? Remember, 42 young people were mauled by the bears because they were making fun of Elisha. I was reading in the book this week, Prophets and Kings, about this very incident. And this is what I read on page 236 and 37. It says, even kindness should have its limits. Authority must be maintained by a firm severity or it will be received by many with mockery and contempt. The so-called tenderness, the coaxing and indulgence toward youth by parents and guardians is one of the worst evils which can come upon them. In every family, firmness, decision, positive requirements are essential. Reverence in which the youth who mocked Elisha were so lacking is a grace that should be carefully cherished. Every child should be taught how to show true reverence to God. 
Never should his name be spoken lightly or thoughtlessly. Angels, as they speak it, veil their faces. With what reverence should we who are fallen and sinful take it upon our lips? Reverence should be shown for God's representatives, for ministers, teachers, and parents who are called to speak and act in his stead. In the respect shown them, God is honored. Thoughts about that? Do you see the damaging effects in our society by failing to teach young people to respect their parents and their teachers and their leaders? What about this idea of showing reverence to God? Does, what does it actually mean to show reverence, reverence to God? Does it mean that when we come to church, we become thoughtless and mindless and say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, who am I to question God? Is that, is that what it means by showing him reverence? In fact, we find examples in scripture of people who were reverent with God, but argued with him. Any examples? Job. Job. Abraham. Abraham. Moses. Yes, they were all reverent with God, but they argued with him. I think this is a, an important thing to recognize because there is this idea in Christianity sometimes, if you have reverence, you just humbly submit. I don't think that's what reverence is. I don't think that God wants that from us. But I remember as a child in church, kind of coming to believe that reverence at church meant that you're afraid to ask anything, afraid to speak, afraid to laugh, afraid to smile, afraid to run, afraid to make noise, because you're in the sanctuary and it's holy, and, and, afraid to, and afraid to step up on the platform. Kids could not do that. That's, 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 that's irreverent. Is, is that what reverence is? Pardon? You weren't afraid. I was afraid. I did it anyway, but I was afraid. <laughs> Seriously, did anybody grow up in a situation like that where you were afraid to actually, you know, express yourself? You, you walk in and it's like, oh, I hope I don't do something wrong because I'll get in trouble in the sanctuary? Is that reverence? So, so what is reverence? Can anybody describe for me what reverence to God actually is? How, how do we teach children reverence for God in a way that doesn't make them thoughtless, mindless, fearful? Yes. I have a question. Yes, she has a question. In the Bible, it talks about fear God, and, um, and yet we're not supposed to be afraid of God because we're supposed to love God. Yes. So is that fear, is that really a better translation for reverence? Right, so fear God is really in modern English better translated as awe or respect, admire. Be in awe, be in admiration, respect. It's not actually, it has anything to do with terror or dread. Perhaps with one minor exception in one place. For instance, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. That's all. Admire, respect, be overwhelmed with his beauty because you're going to give him glory because you're going to have his love in your heart. Perfect love casts out all fear. It doesn't cast out all admiration and all respect and all, you know, love. It, it casts out terror and dread. However, there may be one place it might actually mean terror and dread, and that is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you're having an orgy around a golden calf, and God thunders, and you get scared, and you stop the orgy and start to listen to God, then wisdom has begun. So perhaps there's a place for people in open rebellion and self-destructive activities that when God you know, intervenes in discipline, they actually have a, a fearful reaction. It's not his goal, but perhaps in that context, their fear causes them to stop their destruction and listen, and as they listen, they grow in love, and they stop being afraid. Good question. So what is reverence for God? How do we teach young people, children, to reverence God but not be terrified? And it can begin with reverence to parents. In other words, it's a relationship. <clears throat> you can have a relationship with a parent where you care and all the rest of it, you respect, but you still ask questions, you still have concerns, and you have a relationship that you know this person cares about you. I think this is very much with God. Job knew that God cared about him. He still had, and he had reverence in how he approached God, but he had questions. No, I think this is a very well, in fact, there's multiple um, studies and, and uh, research that shows that the, the view that children hold of their parents influences the view that they ultimately hold of God. And children who've come in out of abusive homes have a harder uh, time of coming to 
to see God as a father figure, they can feel safe and, and trust um, because they couldn't trust their own you know, father if he was abusive and so forth. And so I think that's a, that's a very well stated point that starts with how do we as parents treat our children? Do we treat them in ways? And I was thinking about perhaps taking the young people and showing them amazing things in nature you know, astronomy and, and the huge capacities of, of uh, the universe and so forth. And God is the creator who builds reality and the cosmos and the galaxies and the billions of stars. And as they get the sense of awe and incredibleness, and that God loves you. He knows you specifically on this tiny little planet. He knows you and he loves you. And it's this incredible bigness of God, but still connected directly with his concern for you, the relationship piece, that he still finds you in this massive, incredible universe. You haven't taken time recently to reflect on how big this universe is and how tiny this little earth is in this universe. It's amazing. And the God who created all that is interested in every one of us personally. That's like, wow. What about the other idea in the text that said the only debt we should allow to remain is the debt of love to one another? Where does our debt to love one another come from? From where does that debt come? How did I get in debt to love you? Innate? Other thoughts? It's how we're built. It's a design law, right? It's a design law. Uh, the principle of love, I think, is a design law, but d I have never really described it as a debt. So, but yet the Bible uses this terminology. So I'm, I'm going beyond design law here and saying, how does it become a debt that we owe it? I don't want to speak for people that are hard to love. <laughs> have you ever heard stories of a person who saves another person's life at great risk to themselves? And the person who was saved says to the one who saved them, I owe you a life debt. Have you ever heard that? Or maybe I just owe you a debt or I owe you. They feel indebted to the person. Where does our life, uh, our debt to love others come from? Do we owe ourselves a debt, uh, an oxygen debt? Do we owe our respiratory system the debt of breathing? If uh, love is the design protocol from which life is built, then I, I don't know. I, it doesn't. I think there are better ways to term it than a debt. Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm still struggling. I couldn't quite see the debt part working exactly into the design law part, but except for John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that He gave his only begotten son. We were in a terminal condition and for love's sake, he gave his life for us and we now could say to him, wow, I, I'm in your debt. Or are we not in his debt? Not in some legal capacity, but we were dying and, 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 and he stepped out and did something that was not required of him for us. <laughs> And that might make God in debt to us. When he creates us, then he's now, you know, when we create, we have children, we're kind of in debt to raise them, to love them, to teach them, right? Is there a difference between obligation and debt? No. <laughs> There's not? I think there is. Possibly not in this word. Possibly not what? Possibly not in this word. In other translations, this is translated as an as a obligation. Okay, all right. Or responsibility. Okay, I think uh, when I think of debts, those are something usually that we incur obligations uh, for me. I may have obligations that are different than owing somebody. Debts usually, obligations I can have upon myself that may not even be relational obligations. I have an obligation, um, for instance, to live in harmony with God's design laws that could incur a relational. It doesn't have to. I have an obligation to be honest, for instance. I believe I do. Things are subtle difference, but I can see in this context, 
they could also mean the same thing. If there's an overlap in, in the sub-definitions of what they can mean, there's probably synony syn synonym meaning here. The example you just gave of someone going at tremendous risk to save your life and you feel indebted to them, I think what that means to me is um, it would mean that I feel an obligation. If I had the opportunity, I would return the favor to that person. I would have a desire to also do a deed of kindness to them if the opportunity came up. Yeah, I like that. So this is out of Amazing Grace, page 58. We are under a debt of gratitude to God for the revelation of his love in Christ Jesus. And as intelligent human agents, we are to reveal to the world the manner of character that will result from obedience to every specification of the law of God's government. In perfect obedience to his holy will, we are to manifest adoration, love, cheerfulness, and praise, and thus honor and glorify God. It is in this way alone that man may reveal the character of God in Christ to the world and make manifest to men that happiness, peace, assurance, and grace come from obedience to the law of God. So from where does our debt of love come? Perhaps from God's love and what he has done to save us? And what does it mean to give him glory? To show his character of love in how we live our lives. So how is God giving God glory related to living in harmony with his law? How are those connected? Any thoughts on that? Do you believe, first off, there's a connection with giving God glory and living in harmony with his law? Yes. Okay, so what is the connection? His law is self-sustaining. In other words, if you live in accordance with God's law, it is not destructive. Because? Because? The alternate is one that leads to pain and suffering. Because? You're right, I agree with everything you're saying. Because? What's the because? Well, the, what, what kind of law is it? This is the way God is, this is the way relation is. And this is the way the law, the law of God works. His laws are the design laws upon which all reality are built. Health and happiness are only possible in harmony with his designs, his laws. Breaking them are inherently destructive to people. Yes? That's, yes, always. Not infliction of punishment. Brian? glorifies God the same way when we have a child or a loved one who desperately want to do something for their own good and they respond and do it for their own good it's gratifying because you see them making good choices and it's good for them and you love them I think that's well said. That's what the families are designed to reveal too. We were created in the image of God and the family was originally designed to, to reveal God's love for his creation and his self-sacrifice and so forth. The, the parents representing the Godhead as was mentioned earlier. Yes. When we sing glory, songs that um, point to God, it lifts our spirit. It actually works. You know, it does something to us. It changes us. And somehow when God tells us to praise God and give him glory, uh, in a way he's saying, lift yourself up by, by focusing on me. And, and, and um, so we benefit, it's part of love. It's a response to love. You know, if we receive love and have no response, it doesn't internalize in us. And so you've described one of the design laws, the law of worship, by beholding we become changed. And as we focus and praise and adore and admire and sing praises to God that we admire, we become more, fix your eyes on Christ, the author and finisher of your faith. As we do that, we are actually changed by that. We can't avoid becoming like the God we admire and worship. So that's part of his design. That's why he says, have no other gods before me, because we are the highest created beings on planet earth and anything on earth that we worship will degrade us only by worshiping the infinite perfect one can we continue to advance and develop so you're exactly right how can this idea though this idea of the glory of God being related to living in harmony with his law which I think we all just described and agree with how can that idea though be presented in such a way that people teach it and give glory to Satan and undermine the truth about God instead fear God and give glory to him is taught in such a way that when you keep his law you're actually revealing Satan's character and promoting the beastly method. It's our view that we teach. How can you teach that? How can, it, how can that, those, that linkage between 
fear God and glory to him and living in harmony with his law. Ah, there you go. So, so the idea of promoting the law as a system of imposed rules, that God has made up a list of rules, no inherent consequence. God is the arbiter of a judicial process who when you break his rules, he will use his power to inflict punishment upon you. And therefore we give him glory by keeping the right checklist. And it becomes very pharisaical. And God becomes the one we need protecting from. And thus, this becomes the beastly presentation of God's government, the coercive and you're view. And focused on self when you do that. And you're focused on self. So our challenge is to teach design law from the start rather than imposed law and then having to make a transition. In the same way we teach our kids to brush their teeth, at certain ages, they will do it only because of an imposition. However, something, without really trying, most parents figure out how, as their kids grow, that the kids stop brushing their teeth because mom has a rule, and they start doing it because they don't want their teeth to decay. That's inherent when you, everybody understands the inherent nature of the reason. We need to understand the inherent natures of the reasons that we have rules for our kids, including the principles of God's kingdom and his laws, so that we can, at certain ages, we might just have a rule but as they grow, there's a reason behind the rule, and they transition out of rule keeping to living in harmony with principles and design. So how do we pay the debt of love? Where do we make those payments? I thought I'd read to you Matthew 25, 34 to 40 and see what you think about this. This is Jesus speaking. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me and I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in in need of clothes to clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers, you've done to me. Is this how we repay the debt of love? By loving other people. Yes. We often think of a debt as a singular thing, a time in space. And yet this is a ongoing, continual living of an obligation. <clears throat> it's not just an event. So that there's a big difference between I incur a singular debt, pay it off, and no longer have to do it. This is a way of life. This is a, a continuous. And when it comes to paying a debt, do you ever look forward to making your last payment? <laughs> and, and when it comes to carrying out an obligation, when you carry out an obligation, do you, do you do things for your spouse because you're obligated to do so? Is it the same as you do it because you love them and want to do it? Is that the same thing? So again, I think sometimes the language, oblig the obligation of love, the debt of love, I, I, think, I think, you know, there's an element there, but we don't need to really, maybe we start out that way, but doesn't it become something we actually love to do and we freely want to do? We enjoy and are invigorated when we do. This was out of uh, Testimonies, Volume 3, page 511. See what you think of this. I saw that it is in the providence of God that widows and orphans, the blind, the deaf, the lame, the persons afflicted with a variety of ways have been placed in close Christian relationship to the church. It is to prove his people and develop their true character. Angels of God are watching to see how we treat these persons who need our sympathy, love, and disinterested benevolence. This is God's test of our character. If we have true religion of the Bible, we shall feel that a debt of love, kindness, and interest is due to Christ in behalf of his brethren. And we can do no less than show our gratitude for his immeasurable love to us while we were sinners unworthy of his grace by having a deep interest and unselfish love for those who are our brethren and who are less fortunate than ourselves. What do you think? Do you understand how character develops? Can character be given to you simply by magic without your willful participation and cooperation with that character development? 
And so while it's true that Christ gives us the gift of his character, it's not a legal gift on a book stamped somewhere. It is an imbuing with us of his desires, his motives that we then choose in simultaneous, yes, I want to do that. I want to be like that. And our choosing to follow the inspiration that is new desires, the new motives coming from the Spirit, implanting the, the character of Christ within us, helps our character to develop. But we have to willfully participate. If we don't, then our individuality would be erased. We wouldn't be us anymore. It's only as we agree and participate that our individuality is kept as our characters are transformed. Does this mean, though, caring in this way, does this mean that every Christian should run a soup kitchen or a homeless shelter or a Goodwill? All Christians should do something like that. Why or why not? Yes, no? Thank you. Brian said everyone's gifted differently. This is exactly right. God has given different abilities, talents, gifts to different people because the body of Christ needs different abilities. If all of us did the exact same thing, even if it's a righteous and worthy thing, like running a soup kitchen, but if all Christians did only that, there would be so much neglected and not done. And the, uh, the work would actually be crippled, not advanced. So not everyone is suited for, for teaching, and not everyone is suited for counseling or preaching or, or other uh, gifts. Some are actually gifted with business minds to actually create wealth in order to invest in various causes like orphanages or hospitals or schools. Yes. I have a question that I've always wondered about, and that is, in eternity, we're all going to be perfectly transformed, that it will be completed, um, and people, you know, we hear people say, oh, I want to do this, or be like this, and have an, or I've had, you know, someone, people say to me, I want to be able to see in heaven. To sing in heaven? Yes, or this or that, or I want to have this, be able, maybe it's some athletic thing, or whatever they've dreamed of doing that they don't feel like that's their thing here, that they really like it. So, I do think that we're not all going to be the same in personality by any means, or probably in gifts, but perfection as such, how do you put that all together? So, so my, my view of perfection isn't that we don't make mistakes in heaven. There's no evil. There's a difference between mistakes and evil. Evil is selfishness. Evil is, is, um, is deceit. Evil is, is uh, uh, anti-loves, uh, exploiting others. Um, but I, I see there's a joy in discovery, a joy in working out things. I don't think when we get to heaven that every... Um, problem of, uh, of understanding the cosmos, for instance, God simply downloads all the information we have all knowledge. I think, for instance, when Einstein's in heaven, who loved to study the, the things of how the co cosmos were, were built, and he might be working on an equation, uh, uh, and he's studying. I could see Jesus coming up under his board and making one little correction and saying, hey, try it with that now, okay? Uh, I, I can see that happening. Uh, and, and then, and as he tries it, that a new light goes on, and a whole new uh, excitement of a discovery goes. Uh, th those types of mistakes are not sin. There's no sin in that. So there are some things I would probably still be really lousy at. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Lousy is the right word. I I wouldn't put lousy. I don't think any of this is lousy. I think that that none of us will necessarily have infinite development of any ability. We will always have room to develop, grow, expand our capacities and understanding. But there won't. But all of us will have perfect, other-centered love and selflessness, and in loyalty and truthfulness and honesty and perfect character. But that doesn't mean we will have necessarily perfect ability in everything we try the first time we try it. I think there's a certain joy and discovery and and growth in our exercise of our abilities. I think we can even read, if you read in things like Patriarchs and Prophets, if you value those writings, that Adam, prior to sin, used to study things out and get new insights. New kind. He didn't know everything. He was studying nature and, and learning things. Yes? Well, even in, in, in Psalms and in Ellen White's writings, uh, they're, they're spoken of angels that excel in strength, even, even currently now. So the implication is that there's, there's even a a skill hierarchy in unfallen beings. 
Maybe their angels that excel in speed. Maybe their angels that excel in record keeping. Maybe their angels that excel in guardianship. Or the angels that excel in music. Their angels that excel in a whole variety. Of I think that's actually pretty reasonable to say. Yeah. I think there's good evidence we can make for that. So back to this question of this, this, what Jesus said is you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Does this mean we should go out and find people in need and just hand money out to people? Is that what it means? Why or why not? Maybe not the most healthy. Pardon? It's maybe not the most healthy. Okay, so when you say not the most healthy, could we say it may not be the most helpful? It may actually injure. So helping someone, uh, ministering love to someone, doesn't give someone what they want. It gives someone what's necessary or most helpful for their eternal development. That's an act of love. Does it mean then we always deliver people from difficulty? Somebody is in an object of difficulty. We del it's our job to go out and deliver people from their difficulties. Why or why not? Okay, so first off, people need to want. Uh, Jesus said, I did not come for the well, I came for the sick. People have to recognize the need before any help will actually benefit them. Jesus himself didn't, couldn't help certain people because they, and it says in the scriptures, towns he couldn't perform miracles in because they didn't have any interest. But they had many sick people. So you're right, there has to be a desire on their part, an interest. I think it's a matter of relationships and helping people learn to cope. And if they don't want to, sometimes there's nothing that you can do. Well, and back to what you said earlier about how reality works, one of the blessings of, if I can say it this way, of what happens when we step out of harmony with God's designs is that we suffer. You see, it's a blessing if you touch a hot stove to feel pain. It is a cursing if you touch a hot stove and don't feel pain. That's leprosy, by the way. Leprosy kills the pain fibers. So when you touch the hot stove, you have no pain. Those who touch and have pain, they pull back and they have less damage. So the, the pain of being out of harmony with God's design is designed to alert us something's wrong so it will seek a better way to deliver somebody from their pain when they're living out of harmony and destructive lifestyles and have no desire to change their lifestyles, to take their pain only perpetuates their self-destruction. So to leave someone in that circumstance until what Brian says, they come in the addict's phrase, rock bottom. They realize this isn't working and I need help. Then you can start intervening, but to just take and deliver people from the pain while they have no desire to be delivered that's not helpful. It actually helps them destroy themselves. Yes. I, mean, I agree with everything you're saying, but the, the big challenge is knowing and trying to discern, you know, who really needs the help and who doesn't. And he, because, and then people say, well, you should just be nice and it's not your responsibility whether they abuse your act of kindness or not. I mean, it's just such a confusing situation. And, and what you're saying, I agree with, but on the other hand, it gives everybody the excuse to do nothing. And Does it? Sometimes that's what we do. Does We're it? Doing nothing because we don't want to, you know, make their situation worse. By Does it give us an excuse? You have to actually know their heart, know their circumstance. No. Well, it depends. You're talking about a stranger on the street on the corner with a sign saying, we'll work for food. And you see them out there every, every weekend when the traffic's high and the same people out there every weekend. Okay. They're, they're pretty much advertising that they're not interested. I, I know several people in this community who do build houses and do construction and they've stopped and said, work for food? Okay, you know, come over here and just pick up the trash around this house I'm building and I'll take you out and get you lunch. No thanks, I'll make more money if I stay here. So, you know, people on the side of the road with the sign, to me, in our society, you know, our society is a benevolent society. There are actually food kitchens in Chattanooga. There are places you can go. There are, we have a lot of governmental programs for people. Um, so really this idea that I'm going to starve if you don't stop and hand me is not really too credible in our, our, our society. And you also will notice, I've noticed, if you watch some of those people, if there's a police officer coming up, immediately they pick their stuff up and start walking away. <laughs> and then they come back and the police officer drives by. 
The point, I think, though, it, what it means, I think, is that every Christian should have a heart to love others and to spread God's love and principles where they're able, and thus we have to have some discernment. And I would tell you on so, uh, questions like this, this is Romans 14. Every person has to be fully persuaded in their mind. You and your relation with God and your own conviction, uh, t- uh, allowing the Spirit to speak to you at certain times and places, I think the Spirit in certain times and places can convict. This is the time you need to stop and share. This is the time not to for those who have that, that openness and, and daily submission. And what do you think about the last statement in our text? Those who love others have fulfilled the law. If you love others, you have fulfilled the law. How about somebody who loves God Lo- genuinely loves others, is other-centered, self-sacrificial, works for humanity and the promotion of uh, the gospel and the kingdom of love, but they go to church on a different day than you. Are they still fulfilling the law or are they a lawbreaker? Could it be that God keeps the salt sprinkled around? I've worked with people from many different denominations. There are over three, th- what, th- over 30,000 denominations? But you find wonderful people that make a difference where they're at. So you're they suggesting... Don't think exactly the way you do. So are you suggesting that they are keeping the law even if they go to church on a different day than you? If they have a heart that loves God and loves others? I believe so, because sometimes different people can read or experience the same thing and get different benefits from it. And people are individuals. They're not all cut out of the same mold. Any other comments? Anybody, uh, we all agree with that or is anybody uncomfortable with that idea? That's, uh, that's the essence of freedom, isn't it? That we can all think and be convicted of where we are right now. <clears throat> so what is it that the remnant are described as? Keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. So what do we think that means? If love is fulfillment of the law, then they're keeping the commandments. That means they have hearts that love God with all their heart and they love their neighbors themselves. That's keeping the law or the commandments. And the testimony of Jesus, what does that mean? Through the conscience. Well, what was the testimony that Jesus gave? Oh. If you've seen me, you've seen, seen the Father. The Father and I are one. I'm going to suggest it actually means that they give the same testimony about God, his character, his methods, his nature that Jesus gave. That's what it means. And if you keep the 10 rules and you present the testimony of God that he is something other in character than Jesus, you are not part of that group. You have to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you have to present a God that Jesus presented. Love your neighbor as yourself. You have to have the law of love that you live in the way you live and you have to present God as being like Jesus in character. I'm gonna tell you, there's a lot of people who think they're part of that remnant group because they have a system of rules that makes them feel really good because it's, it's behavioral. I keep all these days and all these things and I behave, worship in the right way and we have certain red leather books. And if we have red leather books, then that means the, the spirit of prophecy. You see, the, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy? No. If, if you're not sure, some of you are looking confused, that's Revelation chapter 19, where it actually interprets what's earlier in Revelation 14. But, but what it actually is trans- should be translated is that uh, the spirit of, of um, the testimony of Jesus is the um, um, spirit that inspired the prophets. In other words, the prophets testify to the same God that Jesus testified to. They all have the same testimony about God. That's really what it means. You want a Bible example from Jesus about this point that I'm making? He told the story of the Good Samaritan. And you remember the story of the Good Samaritan, the three primary players besides the victim. And that was the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan besides the victim. Now, which of, the th- which of these three kept the Sabbath, paid the tithe, ate the right food, went to temple, sacrificed according to the law. The priest and the Levite. Did observing the laws by the priest and Levite make them right with God? Who was the one that was right with God? The Samaritan was the one that was right with God, but did he do any of those those ritual laws? 
Did he keep the Sabbath as far as we know? Did he sacrifice at temple? No, but what did he do? He loved other people self-sacrificially. Second paragraph reads, we should do all that we can to avoid debt. Of course, in certain circumstances, such as buying a house, a car, building a church, or getting an education, we need to borrow money, but it must be done as wisely as possible with the intent of getting out of debt as soon as possible. Of, of those debts listed, which do you think is the most reasonable debt to incur? I have my opinion, I'm gonna share my opinion with you, of all those debts that were listed, house, car, building a church, getting an education. 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 And there's simple reason, what happens if you can't pay back your loan for the house, car, or church? <laughs> they take it away. It gets foreclosed on. It gets repossessed. What happens if you can't pay back your loan for your education? You still have your education. It can't be taken from you once you have it. So the education, I think, is the most reasonable. doesn't mean there aren't reasonable other uh, uh, loans to take out for cars and houses, but I think the education one is a very reasonable one if you have no other means to get the education. Sunday's lesson, the only reason uh, to borrow money is to spend it, is what it says. The only reason to borrow money is to spend it. And then in the third paragraph, it says, we may borrow money with the idea to use it wisely, but the temptation to spend what we have, even of borrowed money, can lead to some very difficult problems. Indeed, spending borrowed money allows many of us to live in ways that we can't afford. Temptation to borrow and spend is the heart of a consumer culture that affects the rich and the poor. When tempted, we should seek God's provision because borrowing can be a curse. Any thoughts about that? What are some of the problems people experience when they get into financial debt? Mental stress and anxiety. Okay, others? Relationships. Relationship problems, yeah. Arguments and uh, over what, what, how we are going to use our money. What else? Overwork and exhaustion trying to pay. How about loss of freedom? You're living as a slave to the debt. You can't go places you'd like to go because you've got to stay in work because you've got a payment to make. How about strained living conditions? Maybe your home isn't uh, uh, have all... I have actually individuals that don't have heat or air because they have debt and they can't afford to keep it turned on. Their living condition is not what it would be if they didn't have the debt. How about guilt? Inability to provide for your family because you're paying debt and thus you feel under a burden of guilt. I'll probably decide they can't afford to pay tithe or... Oh, can't afford to pay tithe perhaps or they don't, aren't able to give charitably. Yeah, another problem with the debt. The lesson asks us to consider Psalms 37.21 about debt. And it says, The wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous give generously. Does this mean that anyone who finds themselves in debt and cannot repay are wicked? The wicked borrow and do not repay, it says. So if you've borrowed, and, and he, is that what that means? It does not mean that. Okay, that's a very wrong reading. And this is, again, these are good examples of how do you read scripture? Well, the Bible said it, if wicked borrow and don't repay, if I don't repay, I'm wicked. No, it's not what it means. What does it mean? They intend not to. Oh, that's it, they intend. These are people who borrow with the intention of defrauding, with the intention of not repaying. This is not about people who have every intention of paying, but they find themselves in some circumstance like a, uh, an illness, a tragedy, a storm destroying their crops, and they don't have the means. It's not talking about that. It's talking about people who purposely borrow with the tent of defrauding. In fact, the Bible, in the Bible, God provided for the release of debts every so many years because he knew that there would be good-hearted people who got into debt and from no fault of their own, they couldn't pay back the debt. And so the system was built to, to forgive the debt every so many years and start over. What about today? How should we deal with people in debt? Should we build a system that every so many years, debts are forgiven? Only if you're a corporation. If you're a corporation in this society, look what happened at the bank bailouts. Many of them had their debts paid. 
and forgiven. This is out of a book called The Adventist Home, page 394. Tell me what you think. If some are found to be in debt and really unable to meet their obligations, they should not be pressed to do that which is beyond their power. They should be given a favorable chance to discharge their indebtedness and not be placed in a position where they are utterly unable to free themselves from debt. Though such a course might be considered justice, it is not mercy and the love of God to put them in that position where they can never free themselves from debt. That's not mercy and love of God. What do you think? Does that mean not selling them a car that would put them in debt that they can't possibly pay for? So one, one practice would be the, the, uh, uh, the, you know, the ounce of prevention practice. In other words, we prevent people by setting up certain standards that if you don't have some evidence to suggest you'll be able to pay the back debt back reasonably that we don't loan the money in the first place. Yes, that would be a prevention. But I think this was talking about people who've gotten themselves, but I think that would be very, very good wisdom. But this is talking about people who are already in debt and now they can't pay back. And I think of the people in our society today who've gotten in a debt and they were doing fine on their debt, but something outside their control happened like a sickness came and then they end up in the hospital and their insurance only paid apart. Now they've got $300,000 hospital debt that their insurance won't pay, but it's on them. You know what I'm talking about. We've all seen it. That, that, those types of people, what do we do for them? You help them declare bankruptcy. You help them declare bankruptcy, yeah. There is a process mm -hmm. this is recognized and you can start over. And so, okay, so there's the legal mechanism, and I think you're exactly right, and that's why it's there to help people in our society for reasons like this. But do people who do that struggle with guilt, with shame, with embarrassment? With, uh, should we then have an attitude of grace and love, and, and it's okay. I can tell you in my practice, I see a lot of people come to see me in financial debt, and, and when the housing bubble collapsed, there were some really... Um, historically financially well-off people who were business leaders in the community that came to see me because they had certain investments that were really reasonable investments until the bubble collapsed and then they were gonna lose these properties, lose their retirement, lose, 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 and they were just being crushed by the stress of it. And they had really done nothing wrong. They didn't have the inside secret information of the bad mortgages that were all being blown up in, the, in Wall Street that ultimately caused this stuff to collapse. I had to help them work through it. How do we help them work through it? I, I gave them a metaphor. In that particular case, I think the metaphor is pretty close. You're, you're, you've got a boat, and you're a boater, and you've got a responsibility to handle your boat in a proper way, following the rules, watching out where you're going. Don't take your boat into an area where the draft is so deep that you're going to ground your boat. You don't want to do that, and you don't. You've never done it. But then somebody blows up the dam, and all the water goes out. Boom. And you end up on the bottom. Your boat's stuck on the ground. Have you done anything wrong? No, but you're stuck. And that's what happened in our economy for a lot of people. They blew up the dam and, and a lot of money went out of the system. And people were able to process that and go, you know, yeah, it wasn't my, I, I didn't put myself in this circumstance because of bad management. And sometimes that happens. Monday's lesson is about Esau selling his birthright for a bowl of food. It talks about how by emotions and feelings he allowed his decision making to be pressured by emotion and feeling trading away his birthright. I think I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that one. I just think it's a really great point. James chapter 1 says we're drug away and enticed by our own evil desires and, and that healthy decision making is when we choose to do what's right and reasonable, not what feels good in the moment. I, I think I'll give you this, this one. Patients who come to see me struggle with, who struggle with decision making, I find there are two major ditches they find themselves in. One, pleasure-seeking decision-making, making choices that feel good right now rather than what is good. And the other ditch is pain avoidance, making decisions that hurt the least right now. And that's a real common one with emotional difficulties. It, it's too uncomfortable to make the apology. It's too uncomfortable to end a dysfunctional relationship. It hurts too much to set a boundary and so they're not actually seeking pleasure, they're avoiding, trying to avoid what's painful. And both types of ditches are destructive. Healthy decision-making is understanding reality, what's actually reasonable, how 
uh, healthy principles work and what decision will result in a good outcome even if it doesn't feel good right now to do it. I wanted to get a little further in the lesson. We're going to jump up. We only have a, about five minutes left. Uh, and we may come back to one of the other portions in the lesson. But uh, Tuesday's lesson, foolish people make no plans to live within their means. The greedy spend wealth at their disposal, even borrowed wealth, feeling that financial wisdom or frugal living is a hardship. Just wanted to let you know, I looked up National Endowment of Financial Education, found that 70% of people who win the lottery end up filing bankruptcy. 70% who win the lottery file bankruptcy. They didn't file bankruptcy before the lottery. After winning the lottery, they filed bankruptcy. Does this have to do with the amount of money they actually have in their possession at one point in time? Or does it have to do with a decision-making habit patterns that never changed? In other words, if a person has not learned self-discipline, not learned delayed gratification, not learned to say no to impulse and choose what's healthy even when it's difficult, would they suddenly change their method of decision-making with a windfall of money? No, and now they have this money and they just spend, 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 borrow, 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 because they have the, now this, in, this certain capital that gives them a certain liquidity that they can borrow against, and, and then suddenly they've spent it all, lost it all. And they have to file bankruptcy. Could allowing people to work through their problems rather than just delivering people from their problems be a greater blessing? Yes. I love the example of both physical therapy and psychotherapy. If you had a loved one who was in physical therapy after an injury and those exercises were painful, would you help them by saying, here, let me do those for you? <laughs> uh, let me deliver you from your discomfort. Psychotherapy is the same thing. You can't help people overcome trauma issues or other problems in their heart by simply seeking to relieve their discomfort or taking the problem on your shoulders to fix for them. You can't. They have to work out the problem for themselves. So Thursday's lesson, last few minutes, it's about investments. And Dave brought me this little note. Uh, it's about investments. Where should we invest our money? Should we invest our money in companies that uh, sell tobacco and alcohol? The, uh, this is from Adventist Today website. And Norwegian Union calls on the General Conference to stop investing in weapons manufacturing. The Norwegian, Norwegian Union of, of Seventh-day Adventists calls on the General Conference to stop investing their money in companies that develop weapons. Those companies could be quite wide-ranging. They could include tech companies who develop the uh, microchips that go into various weapon systems. Right? They could, the, yeah, she goes, how are you supposed to know? How about, should we invest in companies that, are, that have their employees work on Sabbath? Oh, man, some of you didn't like that question. Remember, you're not supposed to have your manservant or your maidservant work for you on Sabbath. You might have a problem, you not supposed to have your money work for you on Sabbath. Oh, okay. <laughs> he said, he's not, he doesn't say you're not supposed to have your money work for you on Sabbath. <laughs> Is that within your gates? Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you, utilities. You invest in utilities. The utilities are always on. Well, all people fit well on Sabbath, right? And there's no fires and there's no emergencies. You know, this is one of the, um, one of the mechanisms of, uh, I don't know if I want to go there or not, but, but this economic pressure is the method of the beast. No one should buy or sell, say him, who has the mark of the beast. Its method is to, uh, and we call those, by the way, um, economic sanctions. An economic sanction is limiting buying and selling for people who don't live the way you want. That's what it is. Is it not? Okay. And now there are the, these social movements that are very aggressive or focused on trying to get people to divest and not invest in certain things that they don't like. 
to try to change social, uh, again, by financial coercive pressure. If you're not green, okay, we're going to pull our money out of things that aren't green. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying it's being practiced. And I think the question of what the Norwegian Union is saying is, do, do we have a moral responsibility as an organization, as individuals, to decide where, or do we just turn it over to a certain um, you know, m mutual fund manager and say, m you know, I just, uh, I'll tell you, minimal risk, high risk, whatever, and let them just do it. That's the common thing for many of us who don't spend the hours and hours and hours and hours of research because we actually have jobs. Just turn it over to an investor, put your money in some company and let them invest it for you, right? Well, I guess we're out of time with that. I'll leave that for you guys to consider as we close with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are a God of love who has poured out everything that heaven has to offer for our salvation and our restoration. Lord, we know that we're living in uh, crisis times here on this, in this planet. We ask that you will empower and enable each of us to be lights in this world, to take a message that will bring true healing and transformation to people, uh, to our communities and around the world, that you might come soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen.